I think the watchword for the day is resilience. Resilience is the ability of a, a person, a community, to withstand shocks. Clearly, there are some shocks on the way, uh, from peak oil, from uh, the bursting of the subprime mortgage bubble, uh, from the possibility of further war in the Middle East if there's an attack on Iran. Uh, we don't know when exactly the shocks will come, although it's, it's pretty clear that some, like the higher oil prices, are, are basically happening right now. Uh, so what can we do to make ourselves more resilient? Uh, typically, resilience involves um, more redundancy. You know, as, as we create these, these systems of just-on-time supply, uh, th that makes actually for more brittle systems. And if we have uh, many food growers, for example, in a community, that community is much more resilient than if all of the food is coming on trucks from a, a food distributor several hundred miles away. So we have to think in those lines about everything that we need, whether it's health care, uh, electricity, uh, our, our water system, our waste management system, all of these basic systems within our community, how can we make them more diversified, more resilient, so that as the shocks come, we can, we can manage them. It's not as though we can insulate ourselves completely from them, but the point is to be able to absorb the shock and recover and come back. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and my guest today is Richard Heinberg, author of Power Down and many other good books. Thank you for joining me, Richard. It's good to be with you, Jenea. Well, thank you for coming to our place, to Lone Bobcat Woods. And part of what's special about this is this um, straw bales that we're sitting on in our compost heap it was inspired by our, our conversation, our tour, actually, that we had with you and your partner, Janet, a year ago mm -hmm. in your wonderful permaculture backyard. So I want to thank you. This is your inspiration. Wonderful. Well, we'll have compost. The other piece of that was that very day we also taped a conversation, I taped a conversation with you in which we talked about peak oil, peak oil, and <laughs> at that point you said, I just want to just look, that was about, that was May of 07. Yes. Here we are in June of 08. You said we'd have 4 to $5 gallon gas and it's now four and a quarter or more in California with record setting, what, $139 a barrel yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, you said that we would see that, that biofuels are a boondoggle and we've had food riots this year, partly because of our corn ethanol in America. Um, we've also had a housing burst, which you didn't, bubble burst, which you didn't, uh, and some real Missed economic fallout. Well, yep. I wasn't expecting you to do that. And your book came out on peak everything, waking up to a century of declines. A lot has happened. Right. And in fact, that was what you wrote in your newsletter for May. It's happening. Mm -hmm. Tell us your view of what's happening now, what we can be looking forward to, or yeah, right, this right. next period of time. Yeah, well, it's a little um, disconcerting and surreal to have been talking about all of this for 10 years and to have been writing about it for the last five or six years in a fairly prominent way. And then see seeing seeing these things actually happen um, when when you're thinking it through and writing about it, saying, well, you know, clearly, you know, global oil production is going to peak within a few years. That's logically going to have this effect and yes. that effect and so on. It's all sort of uh, mental and abstract. And uh, now what we're seeing happen is not abstract at all. It's very real. Uh, the airline industry is uh, consolidating quickly and. Airfares are, are climbing. We have um, officials within the airline industry saying basically that it can't survive with oil at above $130 a barrel. Whoa. Now, Whoa. obviously, you know, it will survive in some form. Sure. It's, it's just not going to survive in the form with which we're familiar. Right. Right. 
Uh, we have um, uh, truckers, uh, independent truckers going bankrupt because they can't afford the diesel fuel, uh, diesel rationing in China now, and you know, we could go on and on. There, uh, these are real world effects that are impacting people's lives. Uh, the, the, uh, I guess just yesterday there was a, the head of the U.S. Treasury said the U.S. is not in a recession. <laughs> I was so reassured by that because you could have fooled me. Everyone I talk to is saying, you know, I can't afford to do X anymore because, you know, right. I, I, I can't afford the and, fuel. And when I was at the grocery store and the man ahead of me said, so they say the consumer price index, inflation, yeah. is only 2% and we all laughed right. because it's not, it's a fiction. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you take food and fuel out of the equation, then they, you know <laughs> you can juggle the figures to make them say whatever you want them to, basically. And but that's, everybody that's I know needs on. food and fuel. Right. So it, that's kind of where we are now, but it's a very volatile situation. So much has changed in the last year, as you were pointing out, and it's a, it's a pace of change that seems to be accelerating. That's what, I, okay. that's what it feels like. Yeah. So um, if I were to make a similar forecast for the next year at this point, uh, it, I'm afraid it wouldn't be a pretty one uh, because it, it, it seems as though um, the, the unfolding of the credit crunch from the, the bursting of the, uh, you know, the housing bubble, uh, th that has, has not reached its, its uh, apex yet. We're, we still have a lot of pa economic pain left and to endure from that. And that's probably global, not just, I mean, it's affecting not just the U.S. Right, right. right. Uh, it's definitely affecting Britain, uh, Europe and other countries to different extents. Uh, but certainly higher prices of food are affecting people in all countries and, and of course the, the people who are in the poorest countries are being affected the most. And I don't see any good news on that front. Uh, all of the, uh, uh, the, the indicators that I see are, are that the, the global food market is going to become even more um, pinched as, as the next two or three years unfold, and we will see uh, even worse shortfalls for, for grains. And then with, uh, with oil and natural gas and coal, um, the price of natural gas has just been on a steady upward climb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oil is more um, volatile. The price of oil has gone up and down. I think that volatility will continue and, and increase. Uh, and even though there may be some speculation in the market, I think it's, it's basically the fundamentals of supply and demand. So generally, I think the price of oil is going to keep going up, and we may very well see $150, $200 a barrel oil within the next year. It's here. Yeah. It's here. What kinds of things do you see people starting to do, actually? What... I'm going to step back a little bit on the lens. Mm -hmm. What you, 12 years ago when you wrote A New Covenant with Nature, right, you talked about civilization and saw it as not a form of culture, but actually a disease of culture, which is a really right. interesting notion. Yeah. And here we are. Is civilization, I mean, is sort of unraveling in front of us? Well, a, a, the particular kind of civilization is certainly unraveling. Um, and this is the apex, pinnacle of civilization that we, we enjoy <laughs> today. Enjoy. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, civilization is, is basically people living in cities and, uh, and having things like writing and mathematics. And uh, it's always based on agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been something like 15,000 human cultures really? that okay. anthropologists have made, been able to catalog directly or indirectly and only about 22 or 24 civilizations. So civilizations are very, very rare in, in human history in comparison with, okay. with culture. All humans have culture, but only a, a very small number of, uh, of human societies have become civilized. Uh, and the reason for that is that civilization is a very energy intensive way of living on the planet. It requires uh, lots more okay. resources. Okay. Um, cities, there was a wonderful book published uh, a number of years ago called uh, Imperial San Francisco by Gray Brecken. Okay. And it's the story of one city that all of us here in Northern California are very familiar with. And just the, the ecological cost 
of the construction and maintenance of this of this one city of San Francisco, and it's uh, it's mind-boggling. You know, basically the the entire uh, ecosystem of Northern California has been raped and pillaged to create San Francisco, and right. this of course this happened over decades and decades. Sure. It didn't, sure. but it's it's an ongoing process. Only now the the the, the area that's that's drawn upon for those resources is much larger it's not just northern right. california it's you know it's uh, china and uh, on right. and on that's right but that's the process that's and the fundamental process of civilization this civilization at least has both fueled by the cheap fossil fuels right. has spread to a huge part of the planet right right pulling resources from everywhere well um, it's it's one global it's civilization at this point yeah. i mean you can you can see that it has various nodes, London, New York, yeah. you know, all, yeah. so on and so on, but it is, it's a globalized civilization for the first time in history. So the collapse, because every civilization has collapsed, which is getting more simple, um, much more simple, I mean, because we're getting the environmental degradation and the population overpopulation, we get, we're in that, we're in that, uh, we're in that collapse? I mean, where are we in that? Well, um, <clears throat> clearly, this level of societal complexity cannot be sustained without fossil fuels. So it's just a question of uh, how far down the, the staircase of complexity we will have to go before we can arrive at a place that is sustainable. Um, if, if the collapse is managed properly, then, then I think you know, we won't have to go as far down the staircase, probably, as, as we would go if we, if we don't manage the collapse and very what well. what is managing the collapse? What might that look like? What could we wish? Well, I mean, uh, thinking ahead, realizing that we can't sustain this level of complexity without fossil fuels, and, the, and therefore planning for a deliberate process of simplification. Relocalizing our economies, basically, is what it comes down okay. to. You know, growing more of our own food, uh, uh, building more renewable energy infrastructure, all the things that, that you know, we're familiar with and talk about all the time. But basically, that's a, that's a, a, those are parts of a big strategy for dealing with this problem. I think that there are folks that believe that we're going to have this sort of crunch and, and uh, when the fossil fuels prices, you know, hit, hit, well, and the decline is there, and that we'll sort of have some bumpy times in here and that we'll have you know, what, 5, 10, whatever, 20 years down the road, other energy sources that take its place. Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that? Um, well, it's, <clears throat> it's problematic because uh, 10 or 20 years from now, we're going to have a lot less energy to work with from fossil fuels. We're looking at not only uh, oil production peak, but likely by that time, certainly regional gas declines and uh, regional and global oil production, or excuse me, coal production peaking and uh, beginning of decline. So with less energy available, we'll be able to carry out less economic activity. So we'll be wanting that what economic activity can still happen to support all of the expectations and needs of a growing population. And we won't have much investment capital or mm. uh, you know, spare effort to put into building a whole new infrastructure of public transportation and millions of solar panels and wind right. turbines and so on, which will cost trillions of dollars. If we're going to do that kind of heavy lifting and heavy investment, we have to do it while we have a, a bit More. extra. More. Yeah. Which, so is, which means now. Basically, 30 years ago is when we should have started. <laughs> we don't have that luxury. So, yes, yes, now. I mean, we, we have a moment to waste. And I don't see anybody jumping on this. Yeah, no. So we're, we may get further down the steps than, than we want to. Right. It's, it's, uh, we've, we have missed most of the best opportunities to manage the collapse. So here we are. What do we do now? Um, you speak, you've spoken about communities building some resilience, mm -hmm. some contingency plans. Talk to us about that idea. Right. Um, well, this is uh, an essay I published uh, a couple of months ago. Um, as a result of thinking about the, the kinds of efforts that are going on uh, around the world to, to deal with peak oil and climate change. Most of them are proactive efforts looking at, okay, what kind of world do we want to have in 50 years? 
how do we backcast from that and get there through gradual steps. And that's all very important. We should be doing those things. We should be thinking now about how to make those next investments in public transportation, alternative energy, and, and so on. But meanwhile, it, there's a very strong likelihood that we will be facing some short-term catastrophic events from collapsing economies, um, the bursting of the housing bubble, peak oil, possibility of a U.S. attack on Iran. I mean, what if that happens? It, you know, who knows what, what, what kinds of... Uh, the point is that these, these sorts of short-term, intense, catastrophic events are not unlikely. They're, they're more likely than not. Katrina tells us even in that area as well, right. too. Right, right. Uh, events from climate change also. So shouldn't we be planning for those kinds of, of events? And so what, what kind of planning would, would, would be helpful? Um, so in that essay, I suggested that, that uh, there probably already are, within almost any sizable community, groups of people who are and have been for a long time trying to do things without fossil fuels, whether they think of it in those terms or not, whether it's organic food production sure. or herbalism, you know, which is a form of health care that, that isn't reliant on the giant pharmaceutical yeah. industries yes. that are so fuel dependent and so on. Well, these folks should, you know, they need to be thinking about how could uh, they deploy their, their skills, their, their knowledge on a much wider basis over a short period of time. What, what would they need in order to accomplish that? They would obviously be needing to teach a lot more people how to do these things. They would, they would need some materials and so on. Well, we need, to, we need to be able to support them in thinking those things through and making those services available uh, in situations of, uh, of great need. So, I, I mean, my mind goes to everything from pumping water. Right. Some of which will still need some... Um, he, least. Human waste, uh, what, what do we do in that kind of situation? And of course there are people who are thinking along those, those lines, but very few of them, and, how, and that knowledge needs to, needs to be available on a broader basis. The picture basis. You, you paint with this I'm think, makes me think of the smaller scale solutions, like humanure, like mm -hmm. compost, right. sure. like, and, you know, and, and you're talking about using simpler tools. Right. Right. You're talking not about chainsaws, but cutting saws. Right. And files. Too, yeah. What you know? if what if the grid goes down and we don't have oil? What do we do in that kind of situation? Obviously, it's Ooh. it's an enormous challenge. But uh, people lived that way for you know, basically until the last hundred years. So it can be done. But we have it's it's more helpful if we're prepared for it than if suddenly it happens sure. and no one's prepared. Sure. The part that I really appealed to me in what you said there is that notion that. Um, the idea that came to you from the folks in Cuba who went through the peak oil right. crunch in the early 90s when Russia uh, collapsed, um, having, you know, the, the folks that were working with permaculture sort of came up out of the woodwork. They'd been working quietly mm -hmm. um, and suddenly were deployed to teach a lot of people right. how to do urban gardening. Right, they'd, and so they'd on. been saying these things for, for years and years and no one listened to them. Instead, Cuban agriculture was the big state owned farms, giant Soviet tractors. But when the crunch came, then, then they, they were able to basically redesign the Cuban food system. But if those people hadn't been there, yes. if they hadn't had a plan, uh, Cuba couldn't have survived. So it strikes me that what a community could be doing is at least starting with identifying who in mm -hmm. our community has this knowledge. Right. And then how do we help them um, disseminate that knowledge? I mean, mm -hmm. I think of the native people who knew how to forage off this land you know, sure. 150 years ago, 200 years ago, some of, many of those plants still being here. Right. But would we know mm -hmm. them? Yeah. Um, in an urban environment, environment i got to imagine that's got to be it. There are a lot of things to think through. Tough. Yeah, absolutely. Tough call. So we need, we need both kinds of thinking going on simultaneously. The, the longer term transition strategies and also the, the, the more short term uh, disaster management strategies. Disaster management also gets me thinking of things like our fire departments, our, mm -hmm. our law enforcement, yep. which rely, I mean, more of whom may be moving to hybrids, say, right. um, but there's still a lot of infrastructure that right. all of that requires. Well, the, if there's a good argument for biofuels, for example, I think it's, it's for 
uh, emergency vehicles and also for, for farm equipment. Uh, even if the energy return on energy investment is low or, or even negative, uh, you need the, the uh, emergency yeah. vehicles. So that's that's in, a worth, in that case, worthwhile yeah. investment. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> the thing that I think a lot of folks are saying, if this is real, I mean, I understand the feeling of surreal. It's like, I read this three years ago, and it's happening now. That was only three years, right. even ten. Right. Um, the food riots and so on. And it feels like everything... The denial is still strong in our in the main institutions in our country. I don't see, I don't see the financial folks saying the fundamentals of peak oil are what's I mean of, right. of supply and demand are right. really what's causing our, our economic woes. Yeah, it's well, like, the folks are looking for someone to blame. Oh. You know, the, the 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 economic pain is is really starting to to yeah. hit and and. Uh, there are definitely analysts out there who are, are pointing to this, the fundamentals of supply and demand, but um, the politicians generally are, are more likely to look for, for villains. And of course, we've had the, the Congress now um, writing bills to punish OPEC and, and so on, as though that's going to make any difference. Um, or, you know, the Democrats want to punish the oil companies and the Republicans want to drill, uh, drill all of our all wilderness the place, areas. You know, yes, and, yes, you yes. know, uh, the, the oil companies certainly have a lot to answer for, uh, and they should be reinvesting their profits in renewables rather than fossil fuels. But, you know, making villains out of them isn't going to accomplish all that much. I think a lot of the viewers that we have um, on our Peak Moment shows are folks that are just at the family level, the personal level, thinking, okay, how do I take care? Because our culture has us thinking about sure. ourselves that way. Yeah. What can I even do? What I hear in your saying is mm -hmm. um, put the pressures on. Right. It's, it's real, folks. Yeah. It's not imagined anymore. And I, I imagine people who are watching this are probably feeling a certain amount of fear. And, that, and there's healthy fear. I mean, if... If your house is on fire and you're completely placid and <laughs> there's something wrong with you, you know, uh, it's a it's a useful emotion and uh, or you know it's, it's certainly a motivator. Yes, yes, and and I I, I think realistically now we sh we should be feeling some concern about the direction things are going and and we need some adrenaline to get us moving in doing the things that uh, we need to do to prepare personally as communities mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. There is paralyzing uh, fear that yeah. you know just overwhelms us, and we have to get we have to get past that because it doesn't doesn't help. So whatever whatever we can do personally for ourselves to keep ourselves in a, a state of, of alertness and awareness and concern and action, that's what we need to do. So there's a certain um, amount of, of uh, ad personal attitude management that I think all of us need to. You know, yes, do yes. on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah, I mean, to be debilitated doesn't doesn't help. And, you know, the people who talk about getting loading up on their shotguns, right. it's like that isn't going to help us. Move and there's, there's another attitude I see, which is people who are, have been so uh, uh, put off by the direction things have been going for so long that they, they are somehow taking great pleasure in seeing it all fall apart and just kind of sitting back and in taking a very cynical attitude toward it all, and that doesn't help either. No, no, it sort of just delays. Well, yeah. it doesn't well, help them. And it doesn't help anybody, anybody. else. Anybody. That's that's for yeah. sure. Um, the the fact is that uh, even though we put this, we put off for far too long dealing proactively with the the demands of this energy transition, and as a result of that, almost certainly we will see some pretty severe impacts from climate change, from economic contraction and so on. Nevertheless, what we do now will have an enormous difference on who survives, how many survive, how many other uh, species, species yes, survive yes, in ecosystems. Yes. So we, we can't afford to, to, to give up or go into denial or, or cynicism. We really have to just maintain an attitude of, of clarity and concern and, and, and informed action. That's the part that I loved in your book is the question you said, we, we can't avert catastrophe. What you said is, what it is a matter of is how much is torn apart and how many 
or, or how many of the other species also survive along with us? How much mm -hmm. of the human detritus can we pull together and learn from this so we don't hopefully repeat this yeah. way, you know, generations down the road? And that you, we do that not because we know what the results will be. Right. There, there are some folks who actually go so far as to, you know, s hate our, our own species because of what we, we're doing to the planet and to each other. Uh, I would turn that around and say, well, what, what are the qualities of, of us human beings that, that make us deserve to, to survive? You know? And then ha can we identify those qualities and exemplify them? And in that case, we win no matter what. You know? and, yes. and I yes. think that those qualities are, the, are exactly the ones that will lead us to uh, trying to help our communities survive. Uh, saving a species, mm -hmm. making a making a village sustainable. Those are exactly the kinds of, of activities that, you know, would make us worthy of, of survival in the future. Compassion. Yeah. Respect, caring, creativity. I think there's going to be a lot of creativity needed. Well, a lot of absolutely. resources <laughs> needed. A lot of fixers and tinkerers. Yeah. And and, uh, and we're amazingly adaptable. We yeah. we human beings. Yeah. We've been through a lot. Uh, and, and sometimes when times get tough, um, we, we show the very best of ourselves, sometimes not, sadly. But, I'm, that's, that's one of my hopes, yeah. is that people will pull together, as, as we have at times, mm -hmm. in the past. We have two minutes. I don't, even have the right, I don't even have a question that I can think of. Well, it's good to be here in this forest and, uh, and to have quiet and bird sounds because uh, the, you know, the human world is, is going through uh, the beginnings of some very, very difficult times right now. And in, in a sense, I feel there's the, the, the calm before the storm is, yeah. is just coming to an end and you can hear the thunder on the horizon right now. So it's, it's a good time to take in the breath and center ourselves and and prepare. Thank you. I think it's time. And I think that a lot of people will take that healthy fear, I hope, will take that healthy fear and turn it around into to right action, appropriate mm -hmm. action, get together with their neighbors, do what they can for themselves, and start thinking about the wider aspects of all of this. Yep. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. You're watching Peak Moment. Community responses for a changing energy future. This may indeed be the peak moment. Thanks for watching. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and my guest is Richard Heinberg.